Most of us know this in a, a variety of different translations. Uh, I guess for a lot of us, we learnt it in the authorised version. This is a little different in the translation, but still the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back with you again. In my uh, absence, Mick took the opportunity to observe from his perspective, and I agree with him, some of how things have gone as a church, and to advise us on the biblical response to where we find ourselves as a church. He observed that we have grown a little as a church, and our prayer and our hope is that we will continue to grow to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. And ultimately, what we considered last week, although I had to catch up online, is what God has been doing amongst us and what he might continue to do. This morning we will be looking at some familiar passages together. Well, familiar to most of us, but not all of us. And I want us to consider in greater depth this morning what God is doing here. We don't need to worry about jinxing what God might be doing here, because hopefully we are resistant to such superstitious thinking. We should, however, be careful about presuming what the Lord might be pleased to do, to presume to understand the fullness of his plans or the dynamics of every single motion. But he does reveal to us the nature of his work. There are certain features of what he is doing that remains the same. And so far as God has revealed in his word his modes of operation, they can be observed to be repeated again in every age of the church, including this one. And so my hope this morning is that as we observe the operation of the great shepherd in the parables that we're going to look, for, look at this morning, we might glorify him afresh in what he has done both throughout the ages and in our lives and is doing in the church so that our celebrations as a church might align with the celebrations that are ongoing in heaven. To that end, please turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. If you have a church Bible, that's page 821. We're going to begin in verse 1. And we're going to read the whole chapter together. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. That's Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? 
And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven when one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the youngest son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, but you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together before I start. Father God, I am reminded this morning that my speaking and our hearing is dependent entirely on you, that you sustain us in our bodies and in spirits. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning as we look at your word. May we understand what you are telling us in these parables, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, before us, we have three relatively simple parables that will be familiar to anyone who spent any length of time in the church. And we're going to walk through each parable so that we might come 
to the same understanding of what each of them mean. And we're going to focus on the final parable as we try and understand the overall point that Jesus is making by telling these three stories back to back. As we begin, it's important to observe that Jesus has two groups of people in front of him. Two groups we should be familiar with in the book of Luke by now. The first group are the tax collectors and the sinners. Those who are drawing near to Jesus. And as we've observed these familiar categories, we've observed that this term sinners is a general term for all those who fell outside of God's law, obviously, so that people could tell. And there's this specific class of sinner, the tax collector, the person considered a traitor to the nation of Israel, who, being in league with the Roma's, Roman oppressors, was generally considered to be exploiting the tax system for his own benefit. So we have this picture of Jesus surrounded by sinners, even the worst of sinners. And the first group is what the second group is expressing their concern about. They're expressing concern specifically that Jesus is receiving these people. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus' continual adversaries who would themselves avoid such people, who would avoid sinners, complaining that Jesus receives them. And we need to bear in mind as we go through these parables that we have these two primary audience. The sinners and the tax collectors on the one hand and the Pharisees and the scribes on the other. And these parables are given in response to the grumbling. For those who don't know, put simply, these parables are stories that aim to explain or convey something that Jesus is teaching for those who are able to hear. So we're going to look at the first story, the first parable together, often referred to as the parable of the lost sheep. Let's read again from verse 3. So he, that's Jesus, told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. There's many details we could dig into here, but the main takeaway is that we have a shepherd who is unwilling to allow a single one of his sheep to remain lost. As Brian said earlier, easy for sheep to get lost, easy for them to wander onto the motorway. But the shepherd will not allow this. And we see here that the recovery of the sheep, the lost sheep, is a momentous occasion. Momentous enough that it's deserving of immediate rejoicing, and not only that, but not just personal rejoicing, but a rejoicing that involves others. Everyone the shepherd knows, his friends and his neighbours. A sheep that is lost might have been dead, but it has actually been returned to the shepherd. And this drama elicits the celebration the change, the transformation, the dead to life. For the shepherd, the sheep was as good as dead until it was returned to the flock. And as is so often the case with Jesus, he draws out a lesser to greater argument comparing sheep to people. Verse 7, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no repentance. It is the case that anyone might rejoice over the return of a lost sheep. If that's the case, how much more appropriate is it to rejoice when a sinner repents, when a human being comes back to the flock? 
He is, Jesus in his ministry is going out into Israel. He is calling the lost to return to him. He's calling them back into the flock. He is on a rescue mission. And he's claiming that these tax collectors and these sinners that are gathering around him are doing so in repentance, in response to his teaching. This is what the Pharisees and the scribes can't see. That these people are turning from their sin as Jesus rescues them from their lostness. And Jesus here explains, he gives us a window into heaven and explains that there will be great joy in heaven every time one lost sheep returns, every time one lost person is received by Jesus. And so we have this great picture of Jesus who, as a shepherd, goes into the wild to rescue lost sheep all those caught in the snare of sin and he brings them into his kingdom and so we say and we sing with the psalmist the lord is my shepherd and there's enough glorious truth there that we could stop there but jesus chooses to double and then triple this theme to make a further point so we're going to keep going with the first parable in mind let's look at the second parable which is quite clearly twinned with the first parable verse 8 or what woman having 10 silver coins if she loses one coin does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin I had lost. So we have here a very similar story, but you will note that the stakes are increasing. The shepherd would have lost 1% of his livelihood, which would have been difficult for him with the tight margins within which shepherds had to live. But these silver coins represent this woman's savings. This is a representative of 10% of what she had. If you lost 10% of the money in your bank account or in your pension pot, that would be a big deal. Her quest is not quite as great, but anyone who's ever lost any small item in a house knows it's quite a lot of work and quite a lot of cleaning to find an item that could easily have rolled underneath the sofa. And once again, she feels this is worth telling everyone about. If it had become permanently lost, even if it was still in her house, it would be no good to her. If it turns out it was lost because it was stolen, it would have been gone for good. But in its return, there is much cause for celebration. And again, Jesus takes the opportunity to reveal heaven to us. Verse 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In combination with verse 7, we have a picture of a joyful heaven, a peculiarly rejoicing heaven where there is great joy with God and his angels. So the first two parables have demonstrated that Jesus brings about a repentance and that it is right to celebrate the return of the lost because celebrations are taking place in heaven whenever this occurs. Jesus has appealed to the crowd around him saying that they would celebrate the return of a lost sheep and they would celebrate the return of a lost coin. And we might celebrate the return of 50 quid down the back of the sofa or a phone that's fallen in the drain. And so God celebrates the return of sinners to the flock. 
This is establishing that this is Jesus' ministry to call sinners home, to call them to be close to him so that they might sin no more but be rescued and be inside the flock. If this morning you are someone who is living a life where you are lost, where you're still breathing but your life feels as good as death, Jesus is calling you to come close to him. If you feel trapped as a sheep in a thorn bush or as dirty as a coin down the back of the sofa, today is the day where if you turn to Jesus, You can have the thorns removed and be made clean by his death on the cross. He died so that you might be made alive. This was the mechanism of his rescue. And he was raised so he could shepherd you as part of his flock forever and ever. This morning is an opportunity for you to turn to him in prayer. And if you do so, I can guarantee there will be much rejoicing in heaven. Consider these things, I urge. Having established the premise of repentance and rejoicing, Jesus then tells a third parable. And in his third parable, he's going to go deeper. There's going to be more detail. And there's a challenge coming for those who are struggling to accept this truth. It's a longer parable, so I'm going to explain it in sections. It's a story of a father who had two sons, and it begins with the younger son. Verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. It's important to be aware that under the Jewish law and under the customs of the time, when a father divides his property between an older son and a younger son, he was required to give two-thirds to the oldest son so that the oldest son might have a double portion and therefore the second son would only have a third. And it was the case that fathers were allowed to sort out the inheritance before they passed away. And on this occasion, in the context of the story, the father graciously allows the younger son to have and to take one third of the household assets. This would have had to have been the movable portion of the estate. We've got to bear in mind that those of us who are fortunate enough to own property, <coughs> if we consider the value of our property against all our savings, it might well be 90% of all of our earthly goods. But it wasn't quite the same in terms of inflated property values in that day. For the younger son, he's got the cash. He might have the valuable robes, the ring to sell. And for the eldest son, he retains the house and the land and the animals. He inherits the livelihood so that the livelihood does not get split up. This legal tradition helps clarify what happens at the end of the story, so I want you to bear it in mind. So what does the younger son decide to do with these assets? Verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. In summary, the younger son 
he wastes the money, and then the circumstances get more difficult as well. He's foolish, and he's down on his luck. And it leads himself to throw himself on the mercy of someone who owns pigs. What we have here in the English is the phrase hired himself, but in the Greek, it's more literally, he stuck himself to the nearest rich man he could find. It's very clear by the end of the story that he doesn't actually get paid. So this rich man has this delinquent individual coming to him and he goes, well, go and feed the pigs and I might give you something for it. But no one gave him anything. There's not enough spare food or money to go around. And even the pods of the pigs, even the pig food, that isn't given to the younger son. He's got to sit and envy those unclean animals that he's now stuck with as a Jewish person. This is rock bottom. Absolute worst case scenario for this young man. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, for I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Having come to the very worst position, he comes to himself. Or we might say he comes to his senses. He remembers what he's left behind, what he was so keen to leave, and realizes that having spent his inheritance and acted in the way that he has, he no longer deserves to be treated like a son. He realizes he needs to repent of his sins against God and against the way he has abandoned his father's household and dishonored him with his actions. He needs to say sorry for all of these things. And now that he has been humbled, rather than asserting any rights as a son which is what he did at the beginning of the parable, give me my inheritance. He now humbles himself and realizes he doesn't deserve to be called a son, but could he please be a hired servant, which would be better than this situation with the pigs. How does this strategy go for him? Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but while... He was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. Before the son can say anything, before he can make his repentance known, The father runs and grabs him and embraces him and kisses him and accepts him back. The father cuts him off, you will notice, before the end of his prepared speech. He prepared to say, I am no longer to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But he doesn't get that far. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father goes, I'm going to treat you like my son. He doesn't even have to make a bargain with the father. The father is accepting him back graciously. He gives him the best robe and ring and shoes and he calls for a celebration. We're now at the midpoint of the third parable and Jesus is repeating this theme that we've looked at in the other two parables, that repentance is to be received with celebration. 
that the father's lost son was as good as dead to him, but has been received back safe and well. The son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. But with this more detailed story, we see that no matter how much we've previously rejected God, no matter how much we've wasted our lives and resources, God is ready to run to us with open arms if we turn to him, if we turn in repentance. And like with the sheep or with the coin, God is keen to celebrate that moment. And this observation about how God operates is especially relevant to many individuals in our church. Over the last few years, it has been a particular privilege to watch as God has called many who were lost home. Since I joined two years ago, of the people that have joined us, many of them have been in the church in some past part of their life or have known something of God at home, but then have gone on a long period of wandering, but then have come back. Now this has been for a variety of reasons. Some, it's, it's been the same sin as this young man, but for others, it hasn't been about that. It's been about circumstances or a bad church or difficult families have drawn them away from where God wants them to be, drawn them away from the rest of the flock, drawn them away from regular communion with God. But it is a wondrous thing that the Lord has chosen in some cases after many years to draw sheep back into his flock. And for those who have been here to witness it is a special privilege and responsibility as a church that the Lord has chosen to bless us with his lost sheep. All of us, of course, were lost before we came to Jesus. But without going into detail, I'm specifically addressing those this morning who knew the Father, were drawn away from church, but have come back again. I know some of your stories, and they give me cause for rejoicing. And in tenderness and care, we haven't chosen to celebrate with a party every single person who's come in. That would have been a bit exposing, I think, if we'd have done that. But for all of the things we celebrate, like Mary's 95th birthday and long standing with us, let us keep in mind as we eat together this great work that God has done amongst us, that he has been pleased to draw his sheep home. May it remain topmost in our reflections. If we are to line ourselves up with heaven, that is how we should be. And for those for whom this parable feels particularly relevant, I would remind you this morning of the great celebration that happened in heaven upon your return. It may be tempting for you amongst all this celebration to think back on lost years, to think of yourself as a lesser Christian because you wandered in the middle of your years. But God's focus this morning and our focus is on celebrating your return. Though you feel you may have squandered your inheritance, God's love and mercy and graciousness is limitless. Though you may feel you squandered your first robe, he has a new one for you. He's been keeping a ring safe for you. He has new shoes for you. He dresses you again by his grace in the clothes you once rejected and makes it clear to everyone and to you that you are still his son or daughter. You are just as much a loved 
child of God as any of his other children. This was Jesus' message to the tax collectors to counter any sense of condemnation they might have felt overhearing these Pharisees with their grumbling. These tax collectors and sinners, they've been raised in the knowledge of God. They've been part of the people of Israel, the people of God. And they'd rebelled against God's law and even sided against God's people in some cases. But this parable says to them clearly, to those repentant sinners who draw close to Jesus, They are God's children, and he celebrates their return. And if that journey in some way reflects your journey, then we can say with certainty from this parable that this is God's work in you. And that we as a wider church get to celebrate and witness and participate in the great gathering, and in some cases, regathering, of his sheep into his flock. There are, of course, many in the church who are still awaiting the return of a wandering friend or relative. And this parable and those who are around us is a testament to what God is so often pleased to do. You might find it more difficult to celebrate at such times, but remember what God is so often pleased to do. So, to some of Jesus' audience and to some of us today, some of us quite specifically, in the face of grumbling Pharisees, Jesus teaches that returning children are greatly loved upon their return, and this is a cause for much rejoicing. So that's Jesus' response to the grumbling a revelation of his work, a view into the heavenly kingdom, and a guarantee of equal citizenship in the kingdom of God for all those who enter in. But Jesus, unsurprisingly, has something to say to the Pharisees and to the scribes as well that is also relevant to us. We come now to the elder son, where the parables and these three stories finish. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked, what are these things meant? And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answers his father. Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. The eldest son, who claims to have been obedient to the father all these years, now refuses to celebrate with the father, now refuses to come in. He feels that the way that the father is divvying up what remains of the household and giving a fresh inheritance to the younger brother, out of what remains of the older brother's inheritance, is wrong feels this is unjust. (coughs) Giving further blessing to the younger brother is wrong as far as the older brother is concerned. Here the older brother's desires are revealed. For all these years of hard work was not good enough for him. His continued presence with the father was not enough. He wanted to have a meal. Not with his father, not with everyone, just with him off with his friends. But he had this kind of complex of the suffering. Well, I'm, I'm the righteous one. I keep my head down and I don't get any reward, but I'm okay. But this really triggers his inmost desires. We even see him accuse his brother of having been with prostitutes, which is not something he could have known about. 
He, most importantly, does not want to celebrate with the Father. He wants something separate, just like his younger brother. He doesn't share, after spending these years with the Father, the Father's desire for the younger brother to come home. He refers to him as this son of yours. Not this brother of mine, not even this delinquent brother of mine, this son of yours, trying to disassociate himself. The son did not share his father's heart, and he didn't want to. He was determined to make himself right before God, before the father. According to his own standards, I've worked in this way, but I will not be obedient and come in and enter the celebration. Righteousness on his terms before the Father. And the Father comes out. He entreats with him. He tries to rescue the older brother from the situation outside of the banquet that the older brother has chosen to get himself into. We read in verse 31. And he said to him, this is the Father. Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We see the same logic explained for a third time. Such events demand celebration. The older son is invited to remember that he has always been in the presence of the father. That if acceptance by the father is the most important thing, then the older son has always had it. That the reason for the celebration is the fact that now the younger son has come back into relationship with the father. It's not about the fattened calf. It's about relationship. That the eldest son has always had this opportunity to spend time with the father. The son, sorry, the father reminds the son of the legal position. All the remaining inheritance is the son's already. The father has already given away everything he has. Even if the father has yet to die for the transfer to be complete. But the eldest and has not shared in the heart of the Father. And if he had, he would be pleased to share what remained of his inheritance to celebrate such an occasion. This is pointed most obviously and directly at the Pharisees and the scribes, most of whom, as we've seen, do not share Jesus' heart for the loss. They disdain his proximity to the sick and to the sinners. They are be guilty of being like the elder son so far as they have access to the law, they have access to the kingdom of Israel, they have access to God through the temple, but they refuse to celebrate the return of sinners into relationship with God. They refuse to think of these sinners as brothers returning. And they themselves are now refusing to enter into the great banquet. They're refusing to draw close to Jesus because of their own understanding of what's righteous and what's not. We've seen over the last few chapters, just like the elder son in this parable, that Jesus has been warning about those who refuse to come to the banquet. Jesus spoke of a narrow door. And the parable ends without any resolution for the eldest son. Jesus has built up across this chapter, across these three stories, to a cliffhanger. What will the Pharisees do? Will they all remain in opposition to the Father's love? Or will some of them repent of their lack of love for the lost? and enter into the new kingdom that Jesus is bringing about? Will they draw close 
to Jesus with the sinners. For anyone here this morning tempted to think that Christianity is only good for the weak, that it's only a set of moral guidance for the corrupt, that others need Jesus but not yourself, I would urge you to consider what is clear from the Gospel of Luke and from this parable, that those that consider themselves to be righteous in their own eyes but who are separate from Jesus risk remaining outside of the celebration at the day of judgment. The call at the end of this parable is to make sure that all of us have humbled ourselves and come into relationship with Jesus. As a final consideration for us as a church, considering what God has done amongst us, there are some of us for whom the example of the oldest son is more immediately relevant. This is the camp I find myself in, by the grace of God, who have not had a substantial or notable period of wandering in our Christian walk, where the situation and then temptation of the older brother are much more apparent. From such a position, and I know this for myself, it is much more tempting to look at a new or returning brother or sister with an eye of judgment. To feel like our long service is not noted in the same way as other people get excited about the new person or the returning person. Where we are tempted to wish that the Lord would send people who have it all together, who don't wander at all, who don't have complex lives because they spent time wandering. Tempted to bemoan people's brokenness rather than to celebrate their recent rescue. Tempted to be proud that God has preserved us and taken us on a different journey from the younger son. Luke 15 is clear that anything other than celebrating the return of the repentant is inappropriate. Pride, unnecessary cynicism, grumbling like the Pharisees has no place in the Christian life or in this church. And for some of us, this is a battle that keeps coming up. We must remember that long faithful service may not be acknowledged in this life, but that ultimately no good work goes unrewarded in heaven. And that our continued presence with God is what we should savour, is what we should enjoy, is what we should be thankful for. Not tempted to go, couldn't I have gotten away with a little bit of wandering? just had my 30th birthday. I could have spent my 20s differently. Couldn't I have had more fun and come back into the church now? Wouldn't that have been more exciting? Couldn't I have had all of those experiences that I know that some of other people have had? That's a sick temptation, isn't it? But it's there. Because we're fallen and we're human and we're fleshly. And even those who of us who have gone on an older brother's journey have these difficulties or at least to go but I forwent these things I am the better type of Christian who said no consistently forgetting the other sins in our lives the only right response is to rejoice that we have been preserved and rejoice that our lost brother or sister has returned this is the work of the Lord This is what he is doing in this place. So long as he chooses to work in this church, there will be these two types of Christians who've had these walks amongst us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All of us were lost at some point or another. Some of us were lost for longer than others. Some of us are more impacted by our former lives 
in our life now than others. Some of us are still wrestling with the consequences. But all that really matters now is that all of us here who know Jesus have come into his presence with rejoicing. That we are inside of his embrace. That we have new clothes. That we are all adopted sons and daughters of the King. In this sense, our worship is partly ongoing celebration and rejoicing at what he has done for us, what he is doing amongst us in preparation for the great banquet at the end of time. We remain here to invite those who the Lord is still drawing in, come and be part of the flock. Brothers and sisters, may we all say like Paul in Philippians chapter 3, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. However familiar we are with these parables, let us make sure that our response is correct. We're going to rejoice in just a moment. I'm going to pray before we do. Father God, we thank you that you are drawing sinners home. That you have gone out into this world and rescued many. And that you have left your Holy Spirit. You have sent your Holy Spirit so that many would be drawn into your fellowship into communion with you, into right relationship with you and with your Father in heaven. Lord, I do ask that we would never cease to marvel in the way that you have rescued us, that we would remember that we are all sinners before the living God, however we have walked. But in this day, you have clothed us in righteousness. For your name's sake and to your glory, that we all might celebrate together. Lord, help us to maintain that attitude, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Help us to be filled with that hope. Lord, we may not roast the calf this morning, but instead we have our little celebration, waiting for a celebration that will last forever. Lord, help us to rejoice, to sing, to pray, and to live in a spirit of celebration of all that you've done. Help us to do that now, I pray. Amen.